Eric, how you doing, buddy? I like your name. You've got a good one. <laughs> yeah, mine's spelled correctly. <laughs> mine's spelled correctly, though. No, 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 I don't think so. I don't That's think always so. the joke. People, because people always want to spell it wrong. Right? When they spell it, like, with a C, I always tell them it's spelled wrong. Yeah. By definition. I, mean, I think we have a lot more C's out there than we do T's. You know, I ask that question all the time. And, you know, you're, you're definitely in the, uh, the minority on this one. Yeah, precisely why I get my name spelled wrong all the time. It was one of my pet peeves for a very long time. Uh, uh, because I didn't want to correct people. I'm like, ah, it doesn't matter. But now I have high school diplomas and all kinds of stuff with my name misspelled. And then oh, it funny. became, uh, I better start correcting people type of thing. Uh, how often do you get CK? Uh, <laughs> Anyone from South America, I know this is all my, like all our partners in South America, they always spell my name E-R-I-C-K and I go, it's, it's E-R-I-C. But right. it's, it's just kind of, I think, standard. I, I don't get CK very often, um, but I did get it. I hired a laser guy to run my laser engraver yeah. and I had a flashlight. I said, here, you can practice on this. And I gave him my flashlight. I said, just, just put my name on there. He spelled it CK. <laughs> Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Ruin a, a $200 surefire. That's nice of him. And I said, uh, so I, what I did, I had to kind of put a board around it and, and go over it and then redo it. But he, he felt so bad. He's, he just he just made an assumption, which is oh, happens. It happens. It's good to be on with you, buddy. It's good to be on. Big, big fan of everything you do and everything you love, I love. And uh, it's awesome. Uh, where do you start in the shooting sports? I know you. I know you're a trigger puller. You know, it's a, it's a long, complicated thing. And by, by the way, you, you don't know how relieved I am to do this. Most of the interviews I do are either on Fox News or CNN or you know talking about politics. And you know, this is you know, shooting's always been my passion. My grandfather was a big outdoorsman. He's a big fisherman and everything else. But he got Don and I BB guns when we were you know, five, six years old, and we spent a lot of time shooting each other, uh, which is <laughs> <laughs> wasn't wasn't ideal, right? It's, we always had a one pump rule. You know, but then you'd run behind a bush and you'd just hear the other guy just, you know, jacking up the, the BB guns. But, you know, to me, if you, if you could get up, you know, one of those milk cartons, you'll probably remember them of BBs as a kid. That was like the greatest gift ever. And from there, we got our first 1022. I'll never forget it. I actually still have the gun, but it's, uh, you know, just blued walnut iron sights, no scope, no anything. It had this kind of pleather camo, you know, kind of cover on it. Very, you know, early 90s. And we shot that gun. I mean, oh, God, I want to say hundreds of thousands of I mean, We just put brick after brick after brick through that gun. And that was kind of our entry into long range shooting. I mean, this was Greenwich, Connecticut. If you were shooting 22s in Greenwich, Connecticut today, you'd go to jail, right? But there was a buoy in the Long Island Sound about 215 yards outside a, a window. And we'd sit down on this window and, you know, the sights weren't on. And you'd have to hold, obviously, way high, way left. And, you know, if you hit the buoy, maybe a little piece of foam would go flying off of the thing. And, uh, but Don and I just, I mean, we just shot that 1022. It was just great, great memories together as brothers. And, um, you know, we had a, a, a very kind of different childhood being who my father was. We had, you know, guys around us and, you know, some of the military and they got me into the pistol stuff. I started taking the pistol stuff really seriously and um, met a lot of people in the industry and then started taking the rifle stuff seriously, started traveling all over the country, you know, shooting shotgun and, um, you know, did some kind of competitive shotgun and then went back to rifle and, uh, did some stuff at Williamsport in Pennsylvania, some of the, the thousand yard shoots and, you know, met a lot of the guys who shot out there, the, the Hart family, Hart barrels, but uh, the cousins who were, you know, the gunsmithing side of that um, became pretty influential in my life and really got me, you know, into it in a, you know, in a meaningful way. And, um, you know, kind of took it from there. I became a, a nut, you know, every two years I'd fall in love with something else, you know, um, might be sporting plays one year, it might be side by sides the next year, then it was pistols. And, um, you know, then it was a long range rifle. And then I'd go back to shotguns and back to the rifles. But, you know, rifles have always kind of been my my thing. It's what I love. I'm, you know, anal by nature. It's kind of what we do every single day for work, running hotels and, you know, mm -hmm. running spotless operations. I'm just kind of a very anal person. And there's always something about that, you know, precision and accuracy that I just Kind of fell in love with it you know for, for me my yoga you know some people like to get away and sit on a beach my yoga is sitting there doing you know low development on, on a rifle i built and you know it's probably no different than than you it's just uh who i am what i love um you know if, I, if i'm not working that's what i'm doing it's very interesting that you you call that kind of your therapy because it is at least to me it is uh i'm sure a lot of people will feel the same way uh, sometimes when when i'm just fed up or just whatever, stressed out. I tell my wife, I'm going to the reloading room. Yep. 
And sometimes I just sit there and master cases. I don't have to be actually doing anything. It might just, just be taking my mind off of whatever's going on. And it's very relaxing. I'm, I'm the same way in my room. My, my, my wife will tell you that's kind of my, certainly the man cave, but it's kind of my sanctum and it's, it's set up perfectly. Right. And, you know, maybe, maybe that goes back to kind of the analness of it, but it's just everything's <laughs> the right spot set up absolutely perfectly. And, uh, and I love it. I've taken a lot of, I've gone down a lot of rabbit holes, you know, in kind of the precision rifle thing. I used to love the the super small calibers. So um, I grew up shooting a lot of the, the 17 calibers and 14 calibers and all this crazy stuff that you had to form. And mm-hmm. I think if you get older and you get busier in life, you, you know, you kind of maybe lose a little bit of patience for, you know, taking some 22 Hornet and, you know, chopping it down and, you know, forming it down to a 14 caliber and turning necks and doing all that crap. And, um, but I loved it. All right. So I shot, you know, everything from literally, you know, 14 squirrels and 14 Ackley Hornets and things like that, all the way up to, you know, the big boys. And, uh, but I've just, I've always, I've always loved that game. I've always loved building a rifle and then getting it to shoot in one hole. And, you know, so oftentimes once that's done, I'm kind of bored and, you know, want to move on to the next project, if that makes sense. It's like, like, right. Right when the gun's hammering, right when it's shooting through the same hole, right when everything is perfect, you know, I always load up at least a hundred rounds. It drives me crazy to have a, you know, half filled box of ammo, right? So like, I, I like, I like keeping the fill and, you know, a lot of times I'll do that and then I'll literally move on to the next project. That's kind of the, the problem that I also have, except, except with competition. I, I like finding a good load and then I can just stick with that. But for fun, I, I went through that for so long where just about the time it starts shooting small, you go, what if I tried a different bullet? Or what if I did this? Or what if I did whatever? It's just something, because because then now the journey's over, right? Once it shoots tiny, <laughs> what do you do then? Go shoot it, but if you enjoy reloading, you're gonna mess around, play around with different things. Well, you know, today it's easy though, right? So so when I started, I you know I, I was definitely on the forefront of the long range stuff. I mean, I remember obviously we we're all shooting Remington, true Remington actions, if you were really, if you're really fancy, you were, you know, you might've had some kind of barrel block on some heavy McMillan 50 caliber stock or something that you modified into some, you know, big target rifle. That's what we used to shoot at, you know, Williamsport, the, you know, a bunch of times I shot there and, you know, but we were shooting 300 weather beach, you know, like the, the stud bullet at the time was a 240 match King, right. Which I doubt anybody's shooting anymore, right. With the burgers and everything else. And, you know, Remington brass, you know, kind of crap brass, you, you spend all this time weighing and sorting and, you know, tuning up brass. And, um, you know, do you remember the, the, the 36X loopholes, you know, I mean, you look at those compared to the scopes coming on the market today, right? It's just, yeah, the fixed, the fixed power, fixed power, no zero stops, no anything, you know, one inch tubes. Um, I mean, go through it. I remember when the, you know, the very X threes came out, the, you know, the eight and a half to 25s. And that was like, you know, revolutionary. And, and then how you look at the scopes, you look at these tangent datas and the zero compromise and all the stuff. It's it just, it's a different world today. And it, it's almost in a certain way, taking a little bit of fun out of it because it's your barrels are better. Your actions are better. Your stocks are better. Your bullets are better. Your powders are better. I mean, everything's better. And it, it, the, the guns just, they just shoot it, it. It doesn't seem like you need to work as hard today to get them to shoot as you certainly did back then. I'm going to agree with that, but I'm also going to disagree a little because there's still and I know your background, so so we're going to get into that. But the reason you, it, it's only going to work if it's built right. And that is oftentimes the assumption that is made that the gun is right. Oh, it's a custom rifle. It's right, so it's going to shoot. And then they blame everything on their reloading, on their skill, but never do they blame the rifle because the assumption is it's right. I know you build your own, which right you, you kind of build the whole thing from the ground up so as you're building it you're making sure everything's done properly but there's also there's still those cases where the equipment can be at fault there's there's no question and i went down that rabbit hole as well i kind of built my own i, I can't tell you how many times i went out and you know tried to build something and then you get it back and you're just not you're not fully happy with it and I think it was kind of part of, again, not to use the, the word the third time, but kind of my anal personality. I kind of wanted to, to own the process from, you know, from left to right. And um, I met, uh, I mentioned it before, but the hearts and, you know, they were pretty pivotal. I'd be in college and just would want to escape for a weekend. So, you know, go up, shoot long range. They became pretty good friends of ours. And, 
you know, and then it's, Hey, do you want to go bed rifles for five hours because they had customer rifles to do? And sure. You know, so all of a sudden you're betting a bunch of rifles and, you know, all of a sudden you're uh, turning threads on barrels and other things. And those guys were kind of pivotal in my life. And, you know, as I got older and I could afford it, I kind of put together my own shop and, you know, now I do it for myself. And I, I think you're right. The, the assumption is that everything that you got back then um, was perfect. And, you know, it, it probably, it probably wasn't. Now, I remember shooting six PPCs and other things back then that were shooting through the same hole every single time. So they were clearly doing something right in terms of components and bullets and, you know, but it's, uh, man, it, it, it seems like we're in the heyday. It seems like we are in the absolute heyday of awesome components and, um, and actions and scopes and rings and, and everything else. You know I mean? People are just taking it to the extreme and, um, well, yeah. uh, assuming that you can find the components. <laughs> hey, I won't get it. Eric, I promise you we weren't going to get into politics today. That's a, that's a whole different story. I could go into that for a long time while you can't find components and how freaking yeah. incompetent you are. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and that's, uh, you know, everything is better indeed. Also, the communication online. Now you can go online and pretty much find anything. Yeah. You want to know what I'm shooting? you know, you can go to my channel, my Instagram, whatever, and you'll see what I'm shooting, right? You can simply just duplicate that. And now you can go, you can have yourself a pretty good F-class rifle. You want to, you want to shoot PRS? You can easily find where the top PRS guys are shooting and you just build that, right? You want to build Benchrest? It's real easy to find out what they're shooting, build that, right? So it, it really helps narrow down the, the hunt for the perfect rifle. Yeah, there's no question. And honestly, I mean, you've been instrumental in this whole voyage and, you know, it's really amazing, you know, looking back at kind of low development when I first started and, you know, we were all shooting groups, right. And you know, just group after group after group. And it's, you know, take four different powders with the bullet you want to shoot and set a bullet 20,000 off the lands and, you know, go to town and see if something prints well, and then go repeat it and everything else. And then all of a sudden you find out that your velocities were more screwy. I mean, it, it, I think you've been a huge part of the advent of kind of modernizing that thinking and, and a lot of other guys as well. And, um, I, I think it's, uh, you're right. I mean, you know, thinking back, I mean, when was the last time you actually opened up a reloading manual? It's, you know, for me, it's been, you know, I mean, you actually still use those books. It's hard to believe you go on midway or something like that and they, they actually still sell this stuff. And it's kind of hard to believe that people are still buying like, you know, the, the, the Nasa book. I mean, God, God bless them for producing them, but it's, uh, uh, again, very, very different times today than, than back then. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, anything you want, and, and, and they're updated live, not live, but pretty, pretty regularly on the website, right? You want to shoot a Vitavori powder, go to vitavori.com. There's the loads. You want to shoot, shoot a Hodgson powder, go to the website. You want to, whatever it's there. And then there's, you know, websites like accurate shooter and, you know, snipers hide that you can, there's just tons of people that are like-minded that are doing the same thing as you that they can just simply help each other okay. and just just help you get you there as soon as possible yeah yeah that the, the sharing of resources in, in the sport i think is is awesome um I, I think it's been better than you know there's no secrets so, so oftentimes there used to be i think industry secrets and you know in a lot of industries there are and you know uh, the transparency out there now you also have some advice that you clearly don't want to follow right i mean you probably see a lot of that but i think if you do enough reading, you can weed the kind of the quacks from uh, from the guys that know what they're talking about, and um, it saved me quite a few times. And when I say save me, you want to find um, you want to find a load for a seven som in a twenty inch barrel or something along those lines, but you still want to get some velocity out of it, and you can you can go find somebody who has run that exact same setup, and you know at, at least have a pretty good you know starting point for it. Um, yeah, and, and, you, couldn't, you couldn't do that in the manual, so just. You know, what we do. Correct. And that's where people like you or I come in because we like to tinker, right? And we're the ones that are, you know, and people like us that are experimenting with a really short barrel with a really overboard cartridge, <laughs> right? Just for fun. I like short barrels. I, I might be in the minority, but man, I, I, I love short barrels. Short barrels have always shot. They did you shoot well, you know, it, it, I, for your game, obviously I understand it's a little bit different, but I've, al I've always been, I used to be a long barrel guy. Now I'm a total short barrel guy. That's, you know, there's, there's nothing better than a, you know, 22 inch barrel in a, in a folding stock that you can throw in a short little case and throw in the trunk of your car and, you know, not be schlepping around these, you know, massive drag bags all over the place. It's uh, I don't know, maybe it's kind of my progression toward, you know, lazy shooting as opposed to, uh, but it's, they're awfully nice. I don't hardly hunt ever 
anymore, but my hunting rifle has a 16 inch barrel. It's a, it's a six, uh, what is it? I think it's a six by 47, 47 with yeah. a 16 inch barrel. Awesome. I throw, that throw a suppressor on there and it's still pretty short, you know? So I just moved talking about suppressors. I just moved down to, uh, the great state of Florida. I was, I was living in communism in New York for a long time. And, um, the suppressor world is like the greatest thing ever. It's another, another benefit to running short barrels because obviously you're adding seven, eight inches to the front, but it's, uh, you get spoiled awfully quickly shooting cans on every, you know, on everything long range. Like I shoot a, I shoot a dasher and, um, it's got a PRS setup, uh, but you put a, you put a can on that and it's, I mean, you may as well be shooting that, that BB gun that we were talking about at the beginning of the show. It's just, it's, it's so nice, you know, no ears, are- anything quiet, just awesome. Yeah, they are awesome. I, uh, you know, when I go to the ranch, I'll just take mine. And if I need to shoot anything, right, just jump out of the truck and just shoot. You don't have to worry about ear pro or anything. Just, just go right. Hogs. We have a huge hog problem here. So that's the main thing that when I go out there, I'm ready because when they're there, you got to get rid of them because they are just tearing up the place. But anyway, that's another story. (laughs) I got a couple of pigs down in in Texas. We have a, We've helped you. We've helped you. Just uh, yeah, you should have shot more. They are everywhere. Crazy. Now, so you, why did you get into rifle building? You kind of talked about the hearts, kind of yeah, helping them out and learning. But at what point did you say, you know what? I, I just need to do this for myself. I've always been a tool guy. I've always, I've always loved building things. Um, I went to school and they had a great shop program and I mean, I just lived in there. I, my, my whole life is my hands and you know, the people watching this probably think that's insane. Right. I'm a, I'm a kid that was born on fifth Avenue It's pretty in, unconventional for, you know, the world that we live in. All my buddies call me kind of fifth, you know, Don and I both, but the fifth Avenue rednecks and, um, <laughs> you know, that, were, that was awesome. And honestly, you know, to my father's credit, he, put us on construction sites at a really young age. You know, there was no handouts in our family. If we wanted something, we went and we worked for it. It was the most valuable thing we ever did. But I spent summers, you know, torching rebar with the settle, you know, literally taking settling torches and, you know, cutting rebar for, you know, foundations that we were doing. I spent summers doing electrical work and plumbing work and tile wow. work and, you know, cutting down trees with, with chainsaws and running backhoes and other things. And, you know, I think we naturally gravitated toward our hands. I mean, at the end of the day, we're a really big company and we build great buildings and golf courses and other things. But I mean, we're also partially a construction company and, you know, that's kind of the, the, the fundamentals of, of what we do. And so, you know, that was always, A, it was my hobby, B, it's kind of, you know, what I did every single summer. And I just, I loved working with tools. I've always been a tool guy. And again, I said it before, you know, you would, you know, there's some awesome, awesome rifle builders out there. I mean, guys that will know a thousand times more than, than I'll ever know. Um, at the same time, I can't tell you how many times, you know, rifle came back and you were just disappointed with that was shot. And, um, I think being kind of a very, very anal um, OCD person um, who kind of loved it, it's, you know, I can do this and I think I can do it better. And and frankly, it's not even maybe better. It's, you know, these guys are running businesses. They you know, have to support, you know, themselves and their families and everything else. You know, they can't sit there for three hours and dial in a barrel to 10,000th of an inch, right? You know, if, if I'm doing it on a weekend and that's my escape from the rest of the world and everything that we deal with every single day, um, I can and, and I enjoy that. And it's just, you know, I, I think there's, you know, doing it as a hobby versus doing it as a profession is, is you know, you can bring something kind of different, um, you know, to it. And, and yeah, so I set up a, a pretty awesome shop. I got to get you up there one of these days and I just do it for myself. Um, you know, I've myself, I fix all Don's guns. His guns oftentimes <laughs> need to be fixed. Eric, it's, uh, uh yeah, he's the greatest. He loves this world as well. And, um, and, uh, you know, barrels, barrels, a couple's things for, you know, a couple of friends, just, you know, helping them out. And, uh, but I, uh, you know, I, I largely do it for myself, just out of my passion and, um, it's been a lot of fun and, you know, it's, it's great. I mean, kind of back to, you know, barrels and components and other things it's, and I remember when you had to order an action and, you know, you'd order a bat or something along those lines and it would take, you know, 12, 15 months to get. And by the time you got the action, you were already bored and onto, you know, whatever else you wanted to do. And, you know, kind of the advent of, you know, so many manufacturers who are actually keeping actions in stock and a little bit of standardization, but more companies coming out with greater products and, and everything else. And, and, and same thing with barrels. I mean, you probably did this more than I did where, you know, you, you would order Kriegers, what, you know, 12 months in advance because it would take them a while to kind of crank them out. And, you know, shit, today you can go on Grizzly, you can go on Altus, you can go on, you know, any of these things, you know, a hundred different places, local, right? You can, 
you can buy a barrel and have it shipped to your house. You have it two days later and, you know, you're still interested in the project two days later, as opposed to, you know, buying a barrel blank and a twist or, you know, um, you know, um, or that you just don't care about anymore. And so, <laughs> yeah, that, so that's really, that's really helped things tremendously. I mean, it has, and, uh, you know, there's still, uh, what, what has changed for me is obviously now I order large quantities because I have already settled down on what, you know, what I'm going to use. I'm like, I'm going to use a seven millimeter one and nine twist, 32 inch, inch 250. I ordered <laughs> 10 to 15 barrels. Okay. Because in a, in the competition world, it's slightly different. For example, the world championships coming up next year, you don't chamber one barrel and burn it out and then chamber another one, especially when the world championship is coming up, you chamber three, four, five of them, and then you work up a load on all five of them. And then you, cause you want to find hopefully the one that's better than Spare. all the rest, right? Because some, something as important as a world championship, but, uh, but I have learned to standardize everything. I actually built a seven by 47 Lapua PRS rifle so that I can use my leftover F class rifle, uh, F class barrels. Cause they're 32 inches long. Yeah. Cut them down six inches. Cut off six inches off the back. And now I got a fresh barrel and then I use that for PRS. Smart. And then I get to use all my bullets that I didn't quite fight quite fine to be as good possibly for competition. Cause you know, I sort every, it's, it can be a pretty boring, <laughs> a pretty boring thing, but all that stuff gets reused. But you know, that's how I kind of managed to do this. I have massive respect for that. When, when we did some of the, the thousand yard bench rest stuff, it's, you know, you were sorting everything, but again, you know, you're firing 10 shots, right? And versus what you guys shoot today, I couldn't imagine sorting the amount that you guys have to sort for what you do again. I. You know, most of my long range stuff is shooting steel at, you know, a thousand yards or 1200 yards with, you know, six millimeters and, you know, fun, but it's, you know, you, you don't need to be nearly as, I mean, I'm a, I'm a meticulous person on my, you know, but I'm, I'm not at the point where I'm sorting bullets anymore. I just, I'm, I'm not sure if I, if I have that, if I have that up here, it's, uh, I commend you, my friend. I really do. Yeah. It's, uh, it's one of those things that I don't like doing, but it's a, uh, it needs yeah. to be done. I like sorting bullets more than I like losing. So yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. I, I sort the bullets. I'd be sorting bullets if I was in your world as well. So yeah. Well, now I have Jason. Jason helps me out with a lot of this stuff. So uh, he does a lot of the work for me, which is, it's just been so easy. Okay. Easy is not the correct. It's been so much better because he gets a lot of the stuff ready. Uh, and we go shoot. Now I have a shooting partner. We go shoot together. So a lot of it is fun. Uh, it's, it's, I'm trying to put the fun back into it because it, it got to be a, a lot of work. Like, yeah. Monotonous. Yeah. And, uh, but anyway, it, but there's also a lot of tools that are coming out nowadays, you know, right. talk about sorting bullets and all that. Well, now there's tools that, that, you know, uh, I think accuracy one just released one where it's, a uh, you sort bullets based to tip and it's so easy, so fast. Yeah. And, you know, and the other thing is we're starting to realize things that don't really matter anymore. Like we used to measure base to old jive and the burgers are so consistent that we figured out, you know what? It doesn't need to be done anymore. So take that step off, take the that off the table. Okay. Brass sorting. Well, the pool's brass is so good that we figured out, well, guess what? You don't have to sort the brass either. Great. I don't have to do that. What about weight sorting bullets? Well, and uh, see, all this has been tested. It's not like I just one day decided I'm not going to do it. It's all been tested and proven at least to myself that it doesn't need to be done. So guess what? It doesn't get done. Well, also the, the, the whole notion of, you know, kind of progressive presses, um, you know, versus the old single stage presses. I mean, I still load most of my stuff single stage, but we, we, you guys have done because of the quantities of, of what you shoot, how you practice and what you shoot in these matches. I mean, you know, 10 years ago, the notion of trying to load accurate rifle on a, on a Dillon would be almost laughed at. And now what you guys are doing is incredible. I mean, absolutely incredible. And by the way, yeah. I would have figured that out too. Meaning if, if, if I shot as many rounds as you guys did, I, I would have figured out how to make a, a Dillon run like you guys do as well. And, and I should yeah. I run Dillon's for all the pistol stuff, but it's uh, I do everything on my Dillon 750 with an auto drive. 
just I, I do my brass prep there. I don't seed bullets or primers. Uh, but that's a huge help. You throw all the you lube all the brass, throw it in the hopper, turn it on, and that thing can just sit there. And while it's doing that, I'm doing something else, you know. But think, fifteen years ago you weren't doing that. Oh, absolutely not. I and like you said, I was one of those that I would when people say, Well, why don't you use a progressive? I'd be like, Absolutely not. It needs to be perfect. Well, then my friend uh, Jake Christofferson is the one that kind of got me into it. He started doing it, and then I said, "You know what? This guy's pretty smart. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna at least try it." And I tried it, and it took a little tweaking, but once I got it, I got it. And now it's there's no other way to do it. <laughs> I can only imagine. Well, especially if you're standardized, as you said, I'd, I'd have a massive problem doing it because I spend more time setting up my Dillons for. You know, the 70 calibers that I load for is probably actually more than that than, you know, but I, if you're standardized to one caliber, it's got to be, it's got to be a game changer. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, so you talk about, you, you play around with six millimeters. What, what do you play around with? What, what What's your favorite? You talked about the dasher. That's kind of, I think everybody has to have a dasher at some point, at least a six BR. Six BR is so, so easy. So six BR was, was always my, my caliber. I mean, I've been shooting the six BR for, you know, 20 years, at least 20 years, I mean, a long, long, long time. And you couldn't screw it up. I mean, Varget 6BR and, you know, and the old 105s uh, or the old yeah, 105, the, you know, the Hornadies, the A-tips or, or the, um, uh, the A-maxes. I mean, you just couldn't beat that combination. I mean, mm-hmm. they always shot. And um, I didn't really want to get into the dasher because I got sick of you know, forming brass from when I was doing all the 17 stuff, the 17 and 20 calibers or 14 calibers and everything. At that point, I was kind of over fire forming brass. And then a great company called Alpha comes out and they make Dasher brass. And I'm like, I am a hundred percent in. And so I, I shoot, I shoot a lot of BRs. I, I, I love the BR. I still think it's one of the great calibers ever. If I think if I had one, six millimeters, probably that it's just, it's so easy. If you can't get it to shoot, you're doing something horribly wrong. Um, they're just awesome. But I, I love my Dashers. I mean, but I shoot the BRX. I shoot, you know, I, I shoot the six grade more. I love that caliber. I shoot the the six GT um, just built a, a gun in six GT a couple months ago. And, you know, that's been, that's been fantastic as well. Um, you know, I shoot the 647, I shoot the 6547. Um, I kind of shoot all of them. I mean, I'm not sure if there's, I'm really not sure if there's a six millimeter that I, I shot the Hager for a while out of a gas gun. Um, I, I'm not sure if there's a six millimeter I probably haven't played with in some, some capacity. I've just, I've always, I've always loved that bore. I've always loved that, you know, caliber and out to 1200 yard, you know, it's, it's fun. Sometimes you get the big bores out there at, you know, long range it's just kind of, it loses a little bit of the challenge. Like I, I just love shooting far with the six millimeters. The, uh, the six BR is indeed very easy. Uh, one of my guys here, Clay, he, uh, he said, Hey, my dad wants to build a rifle. Just, just something that when his friends come over, he wants to pull it out, sit on the picnic table and they want to shoot small groups at a hundred yards. I said, six BR. Yep. Well, he was looking at something different. I said, six BR. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, well, I think he wants, uh, something with, you know, with more knockdown power or I don't, I, I forget what the, what the criteria was. And I said, wait a minute. I thought you just wanted to punch holes in paper. I said, the six BR has got a lot more potential that you, that you can imagine. Just build a six BR. Well, I don't know. I said, here, I open my safe. I pull out my six BR, hand him a box of ammo. I said, here, take it to your dad, have him shoot it comes back well that night that evening they sent me pictures his dad was he shot a five shot group in like it may start a hundred and eighty thousands or two hundred thousands and guess what he's building six br now <laughs> he wasn't even a shooter right <laughs> yeah and he said he, the two and he, wasn't a shooter. he yeah. said uh which is a very eye-opening experience for him he says i can still shoot he was actually starting to question his own abilities yeah until I, you know, handed him my six BR and just shot tiny little groups. And he's like, all right, I can still shoot. I'm going to enjoy it. So, but anyway, yeah, the six BR, that's probably what I recommend most to anybody. And it's a reload for it. It's like idiot proof. I mean, it's, if, you know, I think my, my load for all my six BRs are right around 28 grains of target, 450 primers, Lapua brass and now we shoot, I, I'm really pretty much almost exclusively burgers, uh, but you know, I, I love the 105 hybrids, but for the longest time, again, I shoot those A-maxes and those A-maxes just absolutely hammered. I mean, they were, that was like the greatest, greatest bullet in the, 
<laughs> you know, I really love that bullet. But uh, now it's idiot proof to load for. I mean, it's if, if that load or something damn close doesn't shoot into the same hole, something is, you know, pull off the barrel and start over because something is horribly wrong. Yeah, for sure. So what's your, uh, what do you enjoy the most, building them or shooting them? I think I'm at actually a point where I like, building them to tell you the truth. I, you know, again, I love, I love the precision aspect of it. I, I love, I love creating something out of nothing. Um, I love metalworking. I, I just think it's, you know, it's fun and kind of the precision of all of that and turning something from pieces into, you know, something that's great. And then I do love that tuning process, you know, and, and uh, um, you know, I, I think every year I you get better and better and better at it. And I've, I've been doing it for a long time and I've kind of run every methodology. I'm actually having a lot of fun, not to give you the greatest plug ever, but I'm having, fun with your tuners, right? Where it's, you go out, you, you know, run a bunch of rounds over a chrono, you find a low ES and, you know, you start tuning in that tuner and all of a sudden they go into one hole and, you know, it's- You're done. <laughs> I, think, Ooh, I, I wish I found this before. And um, honestly, you know, it's 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 weird. I, I, you'll know more about this stuff than I ever will, but it's, I, I actually found that the tuners are really, really, you know, and I've, I've just been playing them really for the last, I don't know, two years that you've been doing them. I think you sent me one of the first that, that you made, but, you know, it, it seems like with some of these hybrids, at least what I found, it seems like some of the seating depth causes the bullets to respond a little bit less than, than they did with kind of, you know, older style Sierras and stuff that we shoot, you know, we shot 15 years ago. It mm -hmm. like seating depth mattered more back then. At, at least this is just kind of what I've been finding lately. Sometimes, I mean, I've played with a lot of hybrids. It's probably my favorite bullet, but it almost feels like seating depth sometimes doesn't matter nearly as much as, you know, it used to. And, and that's, I think kind of the beauty of some of the tuner stuff. It just feels that like you can put it in a good spot, get the ES to where it should be and then tune it in. And you have a gun that shoots well and you went through no brain power to get there. It's, it's kind of been, it's been fun to screw around with. The, uh, my PRS rifles, and I actually started doing that to my F-class rifles, but I started with my PRS rifles. I said, you know, I'm just gonna seat the bullet wherever I want, and I'm just gonna adjust with a tuner. Cause I, I didn't have enough time to tune two different rifles for two different disciplines. Um, actually four rifles, cause I have a, a main rifle and a backup. So now I have four rifles, right? And uh, I thought, you know, I need to just not treat the PRS rifle like an F-class rifle. Cause it was just taking me too much time. I'm trying to get this thing to shoot tiny holes, tiny groups, right? So I said, I'm just gonna leave alone the seating depth and just turn the tuner. And that's how it started. And I had excellent results. Well, then I'd build another one and I'd be like, well, I still have ammo left over from the previous barrel. I'll just shoot it in here and adjust the tuner so that I can practice while I get, you know, a hundred rounds through the barrel or so. And then I can uh, start tuning it. Well, it starts shooting just dots. And then once it sped up, you know, the chronograph, you know, now the numbers are where they're supposed to be. I just turned the tuner again and I'm back in, in tune. And I thought, wow, okay, it's I'm easy. just going to do this. And it works so well that now I started doing it for my F-class rifles <laughs> and it works. I had, I had a barrel, brand new barrel. We took it out. I actually got this on video, but we put it on the, on the rifle. I took ammo from my previous barrel, shot it in this barrel. We went to 100 yards to sight in the, the rifle and we tuned the tuner uh, at 100 yards and it was shooting small dots. Then we moved back to 1,000. I come up, I think 24 minutes, 24, 26, I don't remember, but the point is 20 something minutes and then I just shot five shots at the target. No warm up, no nothing, just five shots. 1.9 inch group. <laughs> And I'm like, okay, this looks pretty good. So then I said, I'm gonna shoot us a, a, a match. Two siders, 15 for record. I shot a clean, perfect score. And I'm like, I'm done. Like, what what else is there to do? I'm done. It's better running back and forth to reloading bench and trying to, you know, move a bullet by five thousandths, right? No, I was done. And and that barrel is still shoots that load. <laughs> Extremely well. I sent you, I sent you, and I texted you a couple, uh, a couple of my targets using the tuner for the first time where I just, yep. Yep. It. there's no question. It, it, it works awesome. But listen, I love goofing around with this kind of stuff, right? If I can try it and you know, if it works, you know, I fall in love. And it's part of the progression, right? It's part of the, it's part of the fun, figuring out new ways to do things, better ways to do things. And it's, uh, 
Yeah, I think that's what actually makes this hobby fun. There's, there's a lot of ways you can approach it, a lot of different ways. Probably a lot of wrong ways that get you to fall into something right. And probably a lot of right ways that, you know, simplify your life. But it's, uh, it's uh, you're onto something awesome with the thing. Thank you. Uh, tell me about MAGA Arms Company or whatever it was called. <laughs> So, so my shop, it's, you know, again, I just, I barrel my own, you know, rifles, replace barrels on my own rifles. If they're not shooting, I, you know, I barrels off in about three seconds and new ones on, right? And, um, but I, I started joking, you know, in, in light of politics and everything, I called it MAGA Rifles USA. And um, so, you know, all the things I do for myself, I engrave MAGA Rifles USA, all the guns, you know, all the, all the rifles I barrel up for myself, MAGA Rifles USA. And so a good friend of mine, Brantley, Rob Brantley, who you've had on the show a couple times, great PRS guy, one of the sweetest human beings you'll ever meet in your entire life. Hell of a shooter. The uh, cat king, the cat king. Cat king, yeah. <laughs> By the way, I was in the gym, this is like two months ago. I'm in the gym and I look up and Rob Brantley is on NBC. Now, Rob Brantley is not exactly an NBC type guy, right? And he's saving a kitten on the side of the road. So I, I, I literally sprint over to the other side of the gym. I grab my camera and I take a picture and I'm like, I send it to him. He's in Louisiana. He's probably still sleeping. It was like five o'clock in the morning. I'm like, buddy, you were just on, on NBC news. What the hell are you doing? Right. Like, <laughs> got seven kittens in his hands. If he gave some family of kittens on the side of the road, you know, and it, you know, NBC runs wild with this story. Now, clearly they didn't look into what Rob did because if they knew he was heavily involved, you know, if, if they knew he was King of two mile and all this stuff, right. Yeah. Clearly they wouldn't have been putting him on NBC, but, uh, um, so anyway, he's like, Hey, will you, uh, you know, will you barrel up a rifle? So I, you know, I, Threw a barrel on for him and he's like man this it was just six gt and he goes this thing is absolutely hammering it was a defiant action it was bart line barrel um in one of the manor stocks and one of those prs ones which is an awesome stock and um american flag i built three of them you know one for me one for don one for for rob and um he goes man this thing is it's it's, it's shooting one hole i mean shooting one hole he's like my next match i'm going to shoot this gun and literally the match coming you know at the end of the match he sends me a picture he, he won first place right and it on the barrel says MAGA Rifles USA. So yeah, Rob is a hell of a shooter, right? He's, you know, he's the top, top of the game in that world. I'm like, how cool is that? Literally a you know, rifle that came out of my shop, just, you know, one of one of the big PRS matches. And a couple weeks later, he goes to another match and 450 shooters, might've been Altus or one of those, but came in like sixth again shooting. He's like, this gun is absolutely hammering. I can't, I can't miss with the gun. And so he starts shooting this American flag, red, white, and blue built by Eric Trump, you know, you know, rifle says MAGA Rifles USA, but people kept on saying to him, they go, Rob, what the hell is MAGA Rifles USA? He goes, oh, <laughs> don't worry about it. a little unlisted shop, you know, really small little gunsmith, you know, you can't even find their number online. And, you know, it, soon enough, I think among, you know, among his friends and our, our little crowd, it, you know, it became kind of a running joke that it was, um, you know, it was me that, you know, sent him the barrel, did all his barrel work and stuff, but uh, he's a, he's a fantastic guy. And it just, uh, it became a little bit of a running joke. So um you're not going to see any barrels out there that say MAGA Rifles USA other than maybe his, uh, his and a couple on, on Don's. But, um, yeah, it became a f fun little thing for us. Yeah, I remember you had me engrave the tuner brakes also. That's right. On the on the bottom. That was fun. MAGA. MAGA. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, By the way, this is your 47th podcast. That's, that's what I heard. Yeah, so I told you... <laughs> Uh, this is was supposed to be the 46th, right? But I, before I even decided, uh, you know, that this that you're going to be on, uh, I had already decided that I was not going to have a 46th episode because just I didn't want that disaster. I, it, it, that is one. that is a very unlucky number. So I had already decided, and it just so happened that you would have been. 46, but I had already decided I wasn't going to have it. So you're 47. So number 47, Trump, maybe that means something, hopefully. Let's hope it means something because what these guys are, you know, it's, it was really, and I, I'm not going into politics at all, but it's, you know, I've told you a little bit of our story, my story, you know, kind of starting out really, really young in the shooting sports, BB guns, et cetera. And man, the thing that kept me, if you look at all my friends, right? I, I grew up in New York City. I want nothing to do with New York City anymore, but I, I grew up in New York City. Three quarters of the kids that I knew um, growing up, rehab, drug problems, serious, serious issues, right? And you actually look at what saved me. And I, by the way, who was a better candidate to fall down that road than, than me, right? Like, and you, and you look at, let me look at my counterpart that's, you know, what saved me? I mean, the shooting sports, the hunting sports, fishing, you know, we were in the woods at five o'clock in the morning. Guess what? That meant we weren't drinking until 
four o'clock in the morning. Like we were, we'd go to bed early. We'd get up early. We were in nature. Um, and for some reason, they never want to credit the shooting industries with that. And I, actually, I think it's something that shooting, you know, the shooting sports do a poor job. Like I'm telling you, the, the shooting sports saved me from that world. I, I could have been one of those statistics so easily. And, and I wasn't because of my love and my passion and discipline. And, and by the way, really good role models who were awesome people who took me under the wing, um, you know, got me to some of these matches, got me to the Williamsport war, you know, got me chambering rifles, like not doing drugs, not screwing off, not getting in trouble, not getting arrested. And, um, you know, for some reason, you know, our sport never wants to tell that story. And that's sad. It is. And, um, you know, there's memes floating around saying, you know, if you want, if you want your kid to not never do drugs, get yeah. them into guns because they won't have any money left, but it's actually truth. It, and it needs to not be told as a joke. It needs to be told as a, as a lesson. But, but how about just the notion of getting up at 430 in the morning and watching the sun come up because you're, you know, you've got a shotgun on your lap and you're, you know, hoping a turkey's going to come into, you know, some decoys. Like, you know, how about that? Guess what? You're probably not going to go drinking until, you know, three o'clock and get into all sorts of, you know, trouble. And, um, and then there's also camaraderie that surrounds that. I mean, Don's, my brother Don's, you know, probably my best friend in the world. He's, you know, him and I have done everything together. And that bond was built, you know, over the outdoors, over the shooting sports, over, you know, fishing and a lot of other things. And, you know, again, I credit, you know, it, it didn't, it, frankly, if it wasn't for those things, we probably wouldn't have had the same bond as we have, you know, today. And um, it's a much healthier life sitting at a reloading bench, tuning in a rifle than it is, um, you know, going out and getting involved in shenanigans. And, uh, you know, but yet for some reason, you know, we're villainized and we're demonized, you know, yet we're probably, you know, the most patriotic and hardworking Americans that are out there in, in so many different fields. It's, you know, and, uh, and, and, and safest. It's quite sad that patriot being a patriot nowadays is by many seen seemed like a bad thing, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's uh, it's it's quite sad, and it's quite sad that people actually fall for that bullshit, you know. It's um, what they've done to disgrace this country is you know I mean they're they're weaponizing every single system in the country for their own political benefit. It's um, it's it's deeply troubling. I mean, you know, my father went in and he wanted to be the, you know, he wanted to be the winning coach for America. And it seems like everybody wants to be the winning coach for, you know, the entire world and anybody but us. And, um, you know, that drives my family absolutely, you know, crazy. We have one team, we fight for, you know, USA. Um, it seems like, you know, everybody else in Washington, D.C. is fighting for everybody else and is fighting against USA. And it feels like it's, you know, guys like us and, you know, kind of, the people who believe in red, white, and blue, and people who believe in the American flag, um, that are the the only thing standing in the way of them totally destroying by far the greatest country ever created. I mean, it's not even it's not even close, and we're so fortunate to live in this country. But you know, it's 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 amazing the powers to be what they'll do to try and destroy it. Those people that want that don't like America are quite privileged because they don't really know the other side of the coin, right? Like I I was born in Mexico. I, you know, we immigrated here when, I don't know, I was just a little kid, 10 years old or so. And I tell you what, I don't want to go back to that, you know, and now what Mexico has turned into, right? And guns are illegal in Mexico, right? And all this bullshit that they're pushing for here. So I'm in Texas, right? And we got dumbass Beto, which Francis, like, we got Francis over here talking about how, I'm like, dude, you live in El Paso. Just go across the border. Live there for a year. If if you want those kinds of laws, just go live in Juarez for 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 a year. Go hang out. Take your family over there, and you Great tell time. me how safe it is. You know, yeah. but it's nothing but it's nothing but bullshit. It's all it is, and you know we know that. But it's uh, they just keep pushing that same same old story, and it seems like more and more people are believing it, which makes zero sense. You know. Yeah, no, it doesn't make any sense. And uh, he's, he's a nut job. And hey, listen, look at the safest places in the country. They're the places that have the most guns, like it or not, you know, and you know, go, go to the cities where, you know, guns are illegal and impossible to buy. And guess what? They have shooting every three seconds. And um, it's it's certainly not you and me. It's not the people who go out and take this stuff seriously and love being in the woods. But yet it seems like we're the target of all the animosity of, of the, uh, you know, of these people who don't know a damn thing about the, the you know, the sport that we all 
you know, love, you know, it, it's, yeah. it's so funny to hear these guys on Capitol Hill talking about, you know, pretending to talk about bump stocks and pretending to talk, they, they don't, they, they don't, they don't know what the hell they are talking about. I mean, it, it's, it's comical. It's like me talking about brain surgery. It's not, it's not my world. It's not what I do. It's not what I know. It's just, you know, kind of stay in your domain. I, I just saw, again, I don't, I don't, I don't know any politicians. I, I couldn't point one from the other, but this, this guy saying, I think it was a brace. And he was saying, this is a bump stock. Bump stock, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like, no, 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 that's not a bump stock. But it acts like a bump stock. No, yeah. it's not. And I wish they could, they were forced to at least demonstrate. Okay, show us, right? Because they can simply just lie. Sure. And as long as they get that, just get on TV with this 15-second clip. Now, they, there's millions of people that just saw that and go, oh, now I know what a bump stock is, right? But you know, the, the arrogance of the people to not at least even talk to somebody about writing their line ahead of time so they don't sound like complete idiots, right? You know, if you're going to be, it's, uh, you know, if you're going to be ignorant toward an issue, at least try and disguise it in a way that doesn't make you look like a, you know, a fool. And I mean, how many times have you seen people on Capitol Hill, you know, the, uh, the semi-automatic muzzle loaders and the, I mean, how it's, it's hard to believe, right? The, uh, um, what did Biden say? The the AR forty seven isn't that what he called this? Some right? like some like that. <laughs> I'm, really, I'm really glad he's writing our you know firearms. Uh, uh, listen, man, I was just surprised he put a sentence together. Okay, give him some credit. <laughs> <laughs> at least he got at least he got half of one and half of the other right. Now, I, got, I mean, it's, it's infuriating because again, I, I really do believe that the most patriotic, some of the greatest, most patriotic people in the world are are the gun owners and. You know, they'd be the first people to run into that school. God forbid, um, you know, something was happening. They would be the first people to defend this country. They, you know, I mean, they, they do bleed red, white, and blue. They don't cause any issues. They're, they're hardworking, whatever industry they are. And, you know, yet they're, 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 they're villainized by people who just, you know, have, have no idea. They, they know nothing about what we, what we love and, and, and why we love it. They've never had the experience. They've never, they've never been there themselves. And frankly, it probably would have done a lot of them very good had they had, uh, had they had actually tried it out. The hypocrisy is what gets me. Like I, I told you, I'm not a very political person. I just believe, I just, what I do, kind of like my podcast, believe the target. I, I just, based on my own experience, is kind of kind of how I how I operate. And, um, but <sighs> imagine if that laptop was yours or Don's. You know, that, that Hunter's laptop, Oh my God. I've got my laptop right here. <laughs> I, I, I can, I can promise. I can, I can promise the two things that if I was stupid enough to ever have smoked crystal meth or the hookers or, you know, and all the other things that he did, all the illegal deals, I wouldn't be dumb enough to have it on my laptop. Let's just start there. But beyond that, you know, but like my parents were great parents and you know, like I, we just weren't going to go down that road. Like we, we were not going to go down that road. We would have been, thrown out of the family so quickly, we would have been, you know, I mean, we were put on construction sites. We were, we were disciplined, we were grounded, um, but had the roles been reversed, right? It's not always the parents, by the way, it's, it's definitely not always the parents. There's some great parents that end up having, you know, challenged kids, but um, had the roles been reversed, Eric, I'm telling you, I'd be in jail. I mean, there's no question about it. It's not even that I'd be in jail. I would, I would have been in jail. I wouldn't have even had it, right? And, you know, they come after me every single day. They come after our family every single day. I mean. They subpoena us. I mean, the second my father went down that escalator, they start sending us subpoena after subpoena after subpoena and, you know, send us every email that you've ever sent with the letter, you know, with the, you know, the word the in it, with a comma. In it. I mean, literally, you know, we tens and tens of millions of emails because we're a great company and great family and never had any problems, never had any issues. I mean, they would just try and find anything, try and find a crime, try and, I mean, you know, the, the, the Russia stuff. I mean, I, I was the guy that got that call. You know, it, I hear that, you know, you have a secret server in the basement of your building that communicates directly with a Russian bank. I go, I don't know anything about Russia. I don't have any friends in Russia. Like we don't have any lenders in Russia. Like we're like an American real estate company with some couple assets overseas. Like, what, what, are you, what are you people talking about? You know, so the guy obviously leaves the FBI, tells him this, calls up the New York Times, calls up the Washington Post. And, you know, Trump has a secret server and the FBI is investigating. So they call me, you know, Washington Post calls me. I. I hear you have a secret server on Trump Tower in the basement that talks to a Russia bank. I go, what, what are you people? What are you people talking about? You know, first of all, like, who's dumb enough to keep a server in a basement because you know basements flood? Like, like who keeps so 
like, let's like start there. Second of all, we're like largely cloud-based, all right? So like, you know, let's kind of ignore those two facts. Like, I'm all like, I don't even know any, but like the, these people are perverse. They'll make up anything that they possibly can. And yet they come after us every single day, you know, yet the guy that has a laptop full of, you know, just bad deals around the world, really kind of awful looking things, taking money from Ukrainian energy companies, and Chinese companies and other things and all these shady deals, you know, drugs, prostitution, you know, all sorts of things. You know, nothing. I mean, absolutely nothing. And it's, uh, you know, we've got to be very careful with that as a country because, you know, I think the whole country realizes that you have a two tiered system of justice. I mean, the guy's wife threw away a loaded pistol and I believe it was a um, shopping mart, you know, a supermarket shopping, you know, uh, uh, you know, lot, parking lot. Could you imagine if Laura Trump grabbed a pistol, a loaded pistol, and threw it away in a garbage can in a parking lot of some? supermarket or whatever the hell it was. I mean, you don't think she'd be in jail for that? You don't think I'd be in jail for that? I mean, if, if I lied on a yellow form, you don't think I'd be in jail for, for lying on that? That, you know, I, if I had real substance abuse problems and they were scattered all over my laptop and I lied on a federal form, Eric, I'd be in jail tomorrow. Like, yeah. You know, but yeah, I have no doubt. The, rule, it, the rules for thee and not for me, right? Well, that's where, uh, well, now they, now they don't like Elon Musk, right? <laughs> They used to love him. I I chuckle every time I see he's trolling the shit out of him, and I love it because cracked me up because you know he he was like you know he was like the model citizen of you know the environment because he was doing electric cars even though they need coal and oil right. and natural gas obviously to to charge those cars right everybody forgets about that part and we get all you know the lithium and other materials from China in order to make those batteries but I mean he was he was like the darling child of of the left for the longest time because you know here's you know, and now the other day I was watching TV and, you know, somebody goes, if you drive a Tesla, you may as well be wearing a MAGA hat. And I go, <laughs> it's, it's amazing how in like four months this whole thing turned around because the guy just believes in freedom of speech, no different than us, right? And he thinks it's wrong that, you know, Twitter is literally throwing the ex-president, you know, maybe the most popular president of all time off of their platform while allowing the Ayatollah of Iran to stay on that platform you know, and he thinks there's something wrong with that. But because he thinks there's something wrong with that, it means that, uh, you know, anybody who drives a Tesla must be, you know, I, I mean, it's like insanity. It's it's absolute insanity. So so Don sent me his book uh, one day and I just posted on my Instagram. Holy crap. Holy crap. Here's the worst part. Wait, among your followers, holy crap. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This was on my other channel, oh, your other my, channel. My, my, my building channel, my Texas Barnominiums when I was building. I forgot. Uh, so anyway, I put it there and oh, my God, so many people were just pissed off. Right. Many people were happy. And uh, here's the they, they don't see it. They, they literally do not see their own hypocrisy because they were saying you are Mexican. You are supposed to hate them. And I'm like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I can't have my own opinions nowadays because I'm Mexican. I'm supposed to, you know what I'm saying? So now they're telling me. So I have white people telling me that because I am Mexican, I am supposed to hate certain people. And I'm like, do you not see the racism in that? Like, do you not see it? The, but they don't. I don't know. They, they, they did that with the Hispanic vote and we won, you know, uh, I mean, there were there were places that we won that had never been won before, like Miami Dade County and you know so many other places. Like you know, the the way the Hispanic vote came over to Trump was unbelievable. The way the African American vote came over to the Republican Party for the first time was was unbelievable because people are sick and tired of being told you know, what, to, what what to think, what to do, what to say, especially when the policies of the other side clearly weren't working. I mean, you know, look at look at all the cities that have been run by you know Democrats for seventy years and. You can't walk down the street without getting shot by, you know, some illegal gun like that. That's a real, real problem. Right. And, and, you know, like clearly the policies aren't working. Otherwise, the cities would be in a lot better shape than they are. And, you know, yet, you know, you have to continue to vote for us because we tell you you'll be racist if you don't. I mean, it's, it's crazy. What do you say if, if uh, what did Biden say? If you're black and you don't know who to vote for, you're not black. Some like that. Uh, something, uh, yeah. some some you know, idiotic. If, if, if you don't vote for me, you're not. Yeah, you're not black. Something along with something that. idiotic like that. But uh, I don't know if this is indi any indication of anything. But back uh, when did when did your dad run? Twenty sixteen. I was in the minority. Like I couldn't around 
my gatherings, family gatherings and friends, I couldn't, I couldn't say that I was pro Trump. Right. Um, but I, but I would <laughs> just, just cause I couldn't, didn't mean I didn't. Um, but anyway, so, you know, it was, I was in the minority. Now I am no longer in the minority. I think people are waking up and starting to see the, the real, the real, the real deal. You know what I mean? You know, I, I think, I think at time he'll want to be known for a lot of things. He's a great developer, you know, phenomenal president and everything else. But I think what he's actually done to educate the country about so many things that were kind of being hidden by the media and being hidden out of plain sight by the politicians. And, um, you know, I, I honestly think they'll actually go down as kind of his greatest service. He, he has woken up a lot of people to a lot of things. He woke up people to the fact that China was absolutely destroying this country. That was, you know, ripping us off. He, you know, woke the whole country up to the fact that NATO was absolutely screwing the United States, right? I mean, we were sending 4.1% of our GDP over to, you know, of the largest GDP in the world, you know, to protect countries from effectively Russia, you know, while Germany and everything who's on their doorstep, you know, wasn't contributing anything at all. And, and, and no one even cared. No one even cared to look at who was contributing and why they weren't contributing. We were just funding it around the world. I mean, look at the World Health, you know, the World Health Organization and look at, you know, their shenanigans, you know, in, in the guise of COVID. I mean, you can go issue by issue. I mean, look at kind of the corruption you see in Washington, D.C., the corruption he called out. And, um, you know, I mean, he's educated people to to so many different facets of this country just because he was willing to go out there and be loud and, and frankly, be kind of a little bit on PC. And, you know, he said it with the wall, uh, you know, it's listen, like we've got to stop the drugs. We've got to stop. Like we've got to know who's in the country. We've got to have a legal process. We can't we can't do this. This isn't working. And I think he woke the country up to to that as well. And, and, and a lot of other things. I mean, and um, I actually think that'll go down as his maybe his greatest service of all. I'm sure you, you're aware, but there's so many clips that are surfacing now of things that he used to say that people are playing now going, holy crap, he, he was warning us and nobody listened or, you know, a lot of people did, but uh, now people are starting to realize, holy crap, he predicted the high gas prices. He predicted the inflation. He, he pre like to the T, yeah. he predicted everything and it's yeah. happening and it's, uh, it's quite well, amazing. He told Angela Merkel, you know, when she, you know, effectively wanted to stop building coal power, car, coal power plants and other things, you know, you may as well just hold the white flag up and surrender to Russia because they're going to own your country. If, if they're your only fuel supply, they're going to, they're going to own you. And, you know, sure enough, look at the situation that's being faced over in Germany right now with, you know, the oil crisis and, you know, Russia turning off their gas and, you know, people going cold during the winter and other things like that. I mean, you know, I, I mean, amazing foresight. I think the thing that probably shocks him the most is how fast it actually happened. You know, I mean, he warned them of this stuff, but it, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy. There's not, there's not a whole lot of common sense, but in, in, in Washington, I, I mean, I, I know that system very, very well now, unfortunately having, you know, kind of meaning, unfortunately, you know, the system, but you know, having lived it and it's, it's amazing. These politicians, you know, the vast majority of them, they don't, they don't give a damn. They're enamored by, you know, the beautiful white marble walls of, of Washington, DC, you know, these big rooms being, you know, wined and dined by lobbyists all day long. Um, they don't give a damn. It, it took, you know, a billionaire New Yorker to go out and, you know, fund his own campaign, um, beat Hillary, which is in a certain way shocking. She outraised him by you know, five to one. Um, and they go in and kind of expose all this corruption. The one person who couldn't be bought or sold or told what to do because, you know, he kind of wasn't one of them. And, um, it's, it's just interesting now watching that system, you know, I mean, he stirred up a bee's nest. I mean, an absolute bee's nest and, um, in exposing them. And, you know, I mean, the rhinos are just as pissed off at, at him as frankly, the Democrats and frankly, the rhinos are, are in, in many cases worse than the Democrats, but it's, um, it's just, it's really been an interesting chapter in life to, uh, you know, to kind of watch. They, they used to all protect each other. Those, you know, the politicians, every single one, you might be a Democrat, you might be a Republican, but, you know, you were all benefiting off of the system. And he's kind of the, the one person who came in and actually exposed the nonsense that was happening behind that curtain. The uh, Dave Chappelle bit that he did. So good. Not long. It, it was so good. And so, and people were laughing, but they didn't even know. It wasn't a joke. Oh, no. <laughs> system is great. How do you know, sir? Because I used to partake in the system. Like, you know, like, and so do all of your friends. And no, 100%. That's the clip you're talking about, right? Yeah. Yep. Fantastic. I mean, 
Ch- Chappelle nailed it. I mean, he nailed it. And then Hillary, no, that's not true. You know, I mean, give me a break. It's, um, you know, frankly, but that's why he did it. I mean, he didn't need to do it. He's a, you know, he, believe me, he lived, he lived a substantially better life outside of politics than he did um, inside of politics. But he was, he was sick and tired of it. I mean, I, I remember just interesting little story for this podcast, but um, we were together one day, we were on, we were on a plane, we we're watching TV and they, it was 60 minutes and they brought these camera crews down to the, you know, the, the ICBMs obviously in, you know, the, in the Midwest and, you know, a, a Miss Lear, this young kid, good looking kids going through and, you know, that phone doesn't work, that clock doesn't work, you know, these missiles are very, very antiquated. He's sitting there and his, his head's in his hands, he's sitting there saying, how the hell would, would anybody be dumb enough to broadcast this on 60 minutes for all of our adversaries? And I meaning even if we're true, and it, it's, it's hard to believe that we're this incompetent that we can allow that to be true. But why the hell would you, why would you advertise that to the entire world? Like going down in our, our, our nuclear missile silos and talking about how the clocks and the phones and stuff don't work. Like, are, are we insane? And, and I'm telling you that that was one of the moments that I think got him to actually run for commander in chief. He goes, I mean, well, we, we have no common sense left. I mean, this is, this, first of all, this is the state of the country. So let's start there. But like, you know, I mean, this is the common sense of our elected officials and it drove him crazy. You know, education 30th in the world, even though we spent like six times as much per pupil to educate you know, how, how the hell could we be doing that? Or let's give $150 billion, $150 billion off to Iran, a country who chants, you know, death to America. Like, like what, what are these people? Like, these aren't Republican versus Democrat issues. There's plenty of those that you can argue all day long because they're, they're hard issues. You know, many social, right? like who gives $150 billion to a country who wants to literally make nuclear weapons and chants death to America? Like, you, you can't make this stuff up. It's, it's, you know, and it, that's, I think, ultimately why he did it. Hear me out. Tell me. Trump primer company. <laughs> By the way, back to a much more fun. I, I just I just landed 4,450 CCI 450s. And like, you know, of, of all places, Bass Pro. Oh, wow. I'm in there. I forget what I needed. And I'm walking down the reloading aisle, which normally has like, you know, two sets of RCBS dies and like, you know, some like corn cob media. And um, I look over and there's just a case. It's like yeah, half gone now of, of, of four fifties. I'm like steel, absolutely. <laughs> I'll take all, you know, I, I took all of it. So, but the point is at least until now, I mean, hopefully things are freeing up a little bit, but no, we, uh, you know, Trump primer company would be, would be great. Um, Trump, uh, Varget, Hodgden Varget <laughs> company would be awfully nice right now. Uh, Trump barrels. Uh, Trump I tell barrels. you, man, <laughs> barrels are starting to, uh, get there in a sense of lead times. I use Brooks and uh, I called Ken last week and I said, Ken, I need some barrels, bad. 12 months, Ken, yeah, it's, me. <laughs> it's me, it's me. Yeah. I, you know, I, I wear your name on my shirt. He said, Eric, I can't put you ahead of nobody else. Like I, I can't do that, 12 months. Oh. Okay, put me in, you know, but it's, uh, it's I had a barrel company, Eric, you would go, you'd go right to the front of the line. All right. <laughs> Trump barrels happen. We're gonna... <laughs> we need to make that happen because holy smokes, it's getting bad. And I don't know what it is. I honestly, well, I think I have a pretty good idea what it is. Um, with things the way they are, everybody just, instead of buying one or two, like we used to, yeah. now we stock up because we don't know when we're going to get them. Right. So if everybody d- buys five to 10 rather than one, and it's the exact same amount of people, well, the market just grew by five to 10 times. Right. It's pretty simple math. Actually why, you know, I've actually, I've shot all the barrels, you know, grow up shooting hearts and shillings and lilges and, you know, Kriegers and everything else, but I'm almost exclusively Bartline now. Um, and honestly, I just feel like they've done the best job by far. Again, I have two Kriegers in a heartbeat. I think they make a phenomenal product. I'm just not willing to, to wait, all right? And and uh, I feel like Bartline's done the best job of, you know, of stocking barrels, especially the common ones. Um, you know, you want a M24, six millimeter and a, you know, eight twist or something along those lines. Like you can always find one, you know, somewhere and have it to your door, you know, a couple of days later. I, I feel like with any of the other barrel companies, you just can't. And uh it's, you know, I think it's a testament to what they've done. I mean, they make a great barrel, but, you know, it's, I think it's a testament to, to what that company's done that 
they've just kept things in stock when no one else has been able to. I've actually never shot Brooks for that reason. It's probably the only barrel that I've, I, I haven't played with. I haven't chambered. And it's only for that reason. I just can't, I can't get them in an adequate amount of time that, you know, it's, and again, I'm already off to the next project. Maybe that's my ADD or whatever it is. And like, you know, 12 months for a barrel. I'm, I'm onto, I'm onto a totally different discipline of rifle. Right. You know, at, at that period of time. So that's where I'm at. That's where I'm at with Reamers. Like we'll, we'll sit around and have this, just this crazy idea. Hey, we should do whatever, you know, cause you know, everybody here is, they like, we all like guns, right? So sometimes we're eating lunch and we're just sitting around going, we should build, you name it, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, let's do that. So we had this crazy idea of building a 22 PRC, right? Oh, that would be amazing. We shoot hogs with that. It'd be awesome. Just so flat shooting. Eh, got to wait six months for a reamer. By then, like you said, it's, it's, you kind of on to the next thing. Yeah. Sometimes, okay. sometimes I kid you not, I will order something. I'm like, and I say, you know what? Screw it. I'll wait. I'll just, I'm just going to place the order. I'll place the order. And by the time it comes in, I you literally have, I literally forgot why I ordered it or why what I was order. going to do with it. <laughs> oh, I've, I've done that. I've, I've ordered plenty of stocks by the time it comes in. It's like, I no longer want to build a long action anymore. I want to build a short action and I want to do this and I want to go this way and I want to be a chassis as opposed to a stock or I want to, you know, again, I think that's kind of the, you know, one of the reasons that Bartline I think has done a really, really nice job is I just, I can normally find a barrel and I can normally have it there two days later and it can be on a, you know, it can be on your lathe. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I shoot the actions that I use. I use Borden actions, Jim Borden. Yep. He does a great job, he's a great but, uh, but he's same deal, man. He's, he's backed up just like everybody else. And I was talking to Tate, uh, Tate Streeter from uh, Impact Precision. Yeah. And he's, uh, he's growing. He's, uh, he was gonna move his shop. And now he said, man, and now it just became an expansion just yeah. because of people just, he, he, he refuses to have, he refuses to have a long lead time, which is, I respect him for that. He's, uh, that's to me, that's the way to go. It seems like they've standardized a lot of that stuff. I mean, I remember again going back to the bats and stuff, and I love their actions. But it's you had twenty different models, and you want you know, do you want a round, or do you want a you know, do you want an octagonal action? Do you want you know, it, there are so many different options. You want you know, uh, you know, left pour, right feed. You want you know, I mean, there there's so many different combinations, and now you know, a lot of companies have come out, created a great product. But guess what? You know, you go to Zermatt Arms, and you buy a TL three, and you know, and, and you plop out the bolt face, right? And you, you know, you can, you can have one action that runs, you know, a lot of yeah. different calibers with a, you know, with a $40, you know, bolt head switch. It's, it's, I, I think, I think a lot of companies have been very, very smart about kind of limiting their offerings, taking quality to like an awesome, awesome, awesome level. Um, I'm not saying that that reduces customization or maybe it does in a certain way, but it actually allows you to get a product versus having to wait 15 months and, you know, that's tough to do. That's something that I personally have done here in my shop. People always say, hey, how come you don't make like a 916th thread? Eh, I, I don't, cause <laughs> just, we just don't. It's most people do not use that thread size, yeah. right? So we, we don't make it. Uh, well, can you make a custom one? Oh, no, because I, you know, I don't have the thread gauges. I have to stop the machine, program it, you know, and it's just, it's just lost time. Um, and uh, we have a joke around the shop because, uh, so we have DMG Mori machines and a lot of people say, well, can, can you make whatever, you name it. And we're like, well, no, we can't. And they go, well, don't you have a CNC machine? And, I I go, <laughs> and so the joke around the shop is like, oh yeah, let's make it. Hey, Mori, make a 916 muscle break, kind of like Siri. Uh, so that's kind of the, the joke around the shop. but. We have standardized, it's like, this is what we'd make. And at least for now, you know, maybe we'll expand in the future into different, different thread sizes or different things. But it's, uh, even that it's really hard to keep everything in stock because the machines are running and all of a sudden, you know, you got to make this and that or whatever and keep everything in stock and making something different. It takes time to set up. It takes time to, to make sure it's good. You know, it's just takes too much time in my opinion. And just, just well, not worth it. While your brakes are actually in stock and you can go online and, and order them, right? Versus again, yeah. the age old problem that everybody had before where, you know, 
all of a sudden it's custom order thing and you're, you're waiting. Yeah. So that was my thing. It's like, it, it, you know, it needs to be in stock. And when we, uh, when I hardly ever have sales, but like we had a black Friday sale and, uh, and sometimes when I, I don't know, I think we were moving in a machine or something. I, I went online and I, I made a video and I said, Hey, here's the deal. We like to ship like the next day if possible. Right? Like we, we need, we like having everything in stock, but guess what? Now you're going to have a delay of like two weeks. And because of that, I'm going to give you a coupon code, a discount, because you're going to have to wait. Right. I feel like I owe them the, Crazy. the, the fast shipping, fast, quick, good service. You know what I mean? And when I can't deliver that, oftentimes I try to, uh, you know, hook them up with a discount code. Sometimes we just like, for example, we have some right now, as I'm telling you this story, I'm, I'm, I'm looking, cause I looked this morning, we had some orders that were seven days old and that just kills me. Like literally it, it just kills me. So I asked what's going on here. They said, well, the post office uh, lost our package that went to black nitride because all the holiday shipping is going on. Mm -hmm. it, so we finally tracked it down or my wife got on them. And what happened is they didn't lose it. They just hadn't gotten to it. I said them. Which is, uh, I guess, good news in a way. <laughs> but at the same time, there's, you know, there's orders that need to be filled and seven days just kills me. But anyway, that's kind of how we like to operate. Have it in stock and go. Ready to go. We've only made, I think, one custom. And it was a, it was a nut for a tuna break that we made. That was a custom part. Yeah, it was for me. <laughs> was it? Yeah. I remember when I called you, I go, I go, listen, I'm really, really anal. And my barrel, I forget what yours was. I think, I, I think yours comes 930, right? 930 yeah. is uh, at the, uh, you know, at the back end. And I go, I go, Eric, I need, I need 960. 961 or something like that, yeah, right? And, I remember. And it, honestly, it looks sharp. It, I mean, it flows. It well, flows. that was a very easy one. Cause all we had to do is bump the, uh, the offset on that one tool by 30,000 and that's it. It was super simple, but anyway, but, uh, yeah, oh, we don't I, like I, to do I'm honored. I'm honored that the one custom thing that's come out of your shop is for me. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it's fun. It's been a fun, uh, process. You know, I mean, I left being a builder to do this and I'm just glad that it's going well. Again, this is my passion. Building was also my passion, but, uh, as you, as you know, it's a lot harder to, for me, I am very OCD kind of like you, and it was very difficult for me to, cause right as a builder, you can only do so much. You rely on subs a lot. And it was just, it would kill me when we would be making all this progress and I'd show up and all of a sudden something was wrong, you know, and it would just completely kill me. And well, as much as I love the builders, because that's what I do every day for a living, uh, the, this whole community loves you to death. I mean, you've, you've been, you've been so great with knowledge. You've been, uh, you know, you're out there leading the way you've been out there, you know, very vocal about a lot of, a lot of cool things. You've shared a lot of knowledge with, with a lot of people, including myself. I've learned a tremendous amount of, you know, from you and um, about your practices. So keep it going, bud. Honestly, we, we need more of that in this world. We really, we do, you know, thank you. You need, a, you need to come shoot with us or we need to come shoot with you one day. Uh, I think it'll be I'm fun. I'm in, I'm in Texas a lot. So, um, love to do it anytime you're in florida you you come out you know with us anytime and we'll, we'll do anything you want we'll have a great time but uh now you've been you've been awesome i'm sure i speak for your entire audience because i'm one of those members but you've been uh you've been amazing thank you thank you um again and thank you for doing this so now you get to nominate somebody that's the rule right. <laughs> I want to nominate. Um, somebody that you think i should talk to oh man you know don would be a good one um yeah let's do that He's, uh, he's a maniac. So, yeah, I, I probably took the shooting side. Maybe I, I probably took the shooting side more seriously. He takes the hunting side um, the more seriously. He's a he's a maniac. Um, you can ask him how many guns I fixed for him. Fixed. Um, I love that the fixed part. <laughs> oh, oh, I could. He's he's the greatest, and he's he's a hell of a shot. He's a great, great, great guy. But like, you know. But I can't get this rifle to shoot. And I go, why can't you get it to shoot? It looks like a perfectly good rifle, right? And how about this? I'll trade you this 1911 or whatever for this rifle, you know, and we do some kind of like brotherly swap and, um, you know, take it home, take it apart, <laughs> tighten, tighten up. 
tighten a few, uh, you know, scope base, you know, it's like, it's like, Ooh, this thing's jiggling back and forth. And then you go out and you shoot into one hole. So you, you can, you can bust his chops a little bit when you have him on. Um, I'll, I'll tell him to, to jump on at some point, but, uh, no, he's a, he's a wonderful guy. He's a hell of a hunter. He travels all over the world. I mean, he's really, um, incredibly passionate. So he'd be, uh, he'd be right up there at the top of the list. Um, you know, Bob Hart, he's, he's a guy who got me into a lot of this stuff. And, um, you know, he, he was one of the kind of the pioneers of the long range you know, world. His dad was phenomenal uh, in terms of the, you know, one, two and 300 Venturist, you know, shooting back in the day and, you know, pioneered a lot of the kind of the early custom actions and, um, you know, custom barrels and, you know, betting techniques and, you know, tuning and everything else. And, um, he was a wealth of knowledge and, you know, really kind of got me, um, you know, at least educated in the sport. And I, you know, I probably kind of took it from there, but he's a, he's a phenomenal guy and, uh, created a lot of cool cartridges back in the day. Um, a lot of the 30 hearts and stuff like that, the 300 weather be improves. And, you mm-hmm. know, he was a pioneer of that stuff. He'd, he'd certainly be an interesting guy to talk to. He's, uh, he's, he's a great man, but, uh, yeah, I would, uh, I'd put two of those guys up at the top of the list. Perfect. Um, what is your favorite at the moment cartridge at the moment rifle? Cause I know how it works. <laughs> yeah. You know, I actually really liked, um, the six creed more for a while. Um, mm-hmm. I, I shot that and I just have one of the rifles I built with it. It's absolutely hammers. And, and by the way, I call it my lazy man rifle because I just shoot, you know, the factory Hornady, the, you know, whatever it is, the 108 ELD match. And, and that it just shoots into one hole every single time. And so, if you didn't want to load, if you want to be lazy, and I load for everything else. I mean, I lo- other than the 6.5 grade more, I, I think I load for everything else. And um, that gun just absolutely hammered. I love the Dashers. The Dashers great. I, I love the, you know, 6 GTs. Um, I like the 300 PRC a lot in a long action. I've been, mm-hmm. I've been shooting a lot of, you know, I always love 300 Winchester shooting heavy bullets. And, you know, the PRC almost made it even, you know, simpler. And so, um, you know, that's a gun that gets a lot of use. Um, you know, so all of those. And truthfully, I know this could sound funny, um, I like going back to standard two, you know, two, two, three, you know, shooting heavy bullets, 77s or, you know, eighties. Um, and, and I like pulling out the 308 still, you know, it's sometimes fun stretching a 308 to, you know, a thousand yards on steel and actually having wind matter, right. Versus yeah. Yeah. You know, some, of the, some of the long action stuff where it matters a lot less. And so, um, you know, but I, I enjoy it all. I mean, I, I used to enjoy shooting the 14 calibers and 17 calibers and, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll shoot the the shy tax and you know the fifties, and I'll shoot everything in between. But again, my uh, my fun zone has always been kind of you know the six millimeters. Um, one one other, in fact, I I, I love the uh, I love the twenty two Creed more. I've been having a lot of fun with that as well. And I'm shooting that. Uh, what are they? The uh, the eighty eight fives. Is it yeah, 80, 80 and a half? No, it's uh, yeah, it's eighty and a half. The eighty and a half burgers and those you know, are. Those full bores, they just, those things hammer. Honestly. I think that's what, I, I'm not much of a 22 guy, uh, but Frank Galley, I think he said that's what he was shooting in his, uh, what is he shooting? He's shooting a Valkyrie. And yeah. he said those bullets just transformed that Valkyrie into the greatest thing in ever. Yeah, they're awesome. <laughs> uh, they're awesome. They, they woke up that 22 Creed more. I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't get another brand of bullets to shoot, um, a brand that I really like. And I, I went to, uh, I went to, to those 80 and a half and, that kind of absolutely hammers. It's fun to shoot far, you know, because again, wind matters. And so um, I'm having fun with everything. I'm building a, a seven SOM right now. Um, yeah. Another seven SOM really like that caliber a lot. And yeah, I have fun. I have fun with everything. And, you know, at some point I'd like to build a you know proper King of two mile gun. I love, I love shooting a super far. And so, uh, you know, love to get out to one of those matches in the next couple of years. And um, yeah, so, you know, whatever the voyage of the day is, I, I do. Yeah, I've had Paul Phillips on. I'm going to have him on again. And obviously, Robert Brandley. And yeah. it's it's amazing, like, how far they shoot. Because, you know, they some of these matches, they have them over at Whittington Center. And when we shoot F-Class there, they, they have pointed out to me where the targets are. Holy crap. <laughs> Just so far. It's, it's uh I think it's almost the coolest discipline of shooting now. You know, to me, I just love that, you know, kind of unknown range, different angles, you know, far. Shoot big, a massive big, cartridge. Big, big caliber has to be properly tuned. It kind of, kind of pulls in all the aspects of all the disciplines in a certain way into one, you know, and, you know, you have to be precision, but you have to, you know, understand all the other variables. Right. And it's uh, kind of fun. Yeah. The wind definitely matters there. Totally. Everything matters. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I've, I've been approached multiple times by different people asking if I want to go shoot that. And 
I would love to, but right now I'm too too busy with F class with a world championship coming up, and I just know I'm very. If I go and I like it, I'm gonna have a really hard time putting it down. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, yeah. And, and by the way, and then and then the F class stuff will suffer. Oh yeah, and I, I can't afford that right now, but uh, I see that in my future, yeah. building a big. Well, you saw my lathe. I I put the that yeah. I yeah. put that T bass on my big machine. Which is the greatest thing that's ever happened to <laughs> the trucks. Uh, and I put it on there so because Speedy was here about a week or two ago. He was here, and he was asking me about the spindle bore in my lathe. And he says, because, uh, you know, for ELR barrels. And I said, uh, no, my little lathe's not big enough. I said, but my big lathe has a three-inch spindle bore. So I called him when I was making that adapter plate for the T-Bass. I said, how big do these ELR barrels get? Like the absolute maximum. He said, two inch. So we made the, the through bore 2.1 inches just in case I ever want to chamber a two-inch barrel. <laughs> I can do it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. Oh, it's, it's massive. Yeah. So, so yeah, we just made it ourselves. I mean, again, we sit around eating lunch going, what, why can't we just chamber barrels over here? Like, well, it, it, it would require that we make a plate and this, so what we have the machines to do it. Plate, yeah. And then here's the funny thing. It's like, call the metal supplier, see if they can get us a nine inch piece of freaking metal. Right by we needed anywhere about three inches would do and uh i said once we hear the cost we're gonna absolutely abandon the idea all right so so matt calls my machinist he calls him up and he goes you're not gonna believe this they actually have a three inch piece nine inch by three laying on the floor there it's like i don't know two hundred dollars or something <sighs> Go get it. <laughs> it was just meant to be. I'm like, ah, go get it. I'll start writing the program. And by, by the way, think about how much time you're going to save chambering. Uh, you know, your 15 brooks. Yeah. Well, see, that's no the other brooks. thing. I got to thinking, and I'm like, you know what? Once I set it up, oh, totally. I'm gonna. What I really want to do, because this, this, uh, because it has a milling head. I want to do like the 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 gun drill. They call it right, where you spin the chuck one way and the reamer the other way because that's supposed to give you the ultimate in concentricity right because if you have a reamer that that let's say one flute is sharper than the others sure. it's going to want to cut more on that side right so it's going to want to deviate and because the the flute's always at the same place it's going to cut your chamber oversized or it, it's going to want to start doing this number right but now if you're spinning it at the same time as you spin this one, it gives you the ultimate in concentricity. So I'm like, Are you trying this or is it just theory now? No, no, this is, uh, if you're doing like, this is how barrels are drilled and all that gun drilled because you have to spin them different directions. No, but have you, have you tried this on the machine? We're about to. I love it. <laughs> I need a video. We, uh, the, the problem that we're having right now is we don't have a way to hold the reamer because I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold it. I have my uh, floating, a uh, reamer holder but obviously if i'm going to be spinning it i don't want that so it's gonna it has to be solid uh or rigid so i was going to put it on the milling head but then we started looking and uh, and i said oh i have a sub spindle right so i thought the easiest way is chuck up a inch and a quarter bar in the sub spindle and drill and bore uh the the reamer holder, sure. for example, right? Drill it, bore it, and drill and tap a, a, a set screw for the reamer. And then every time I want to chamber barrel, I'm just going to have to make another one. But it's in, it's already in the machine. You know, the machine can do that in, I don't know, five minutes. And now I will have a perfectly concentric uh, reamer holder. When I'm done with it, I'll take it out, throw it away. And then next time I'll just make another one. But that's, and then I'm just going to, I'm just going to do it with my sub spindle. Just bring them together, turn them the opposite way. It's right, going to be fun. When's number one coming out? Uh, probably. I was going to do it tomorrow, but I, I'm going to go shoot a PRS match. So maybe Sunday. Ah. <laughs> and I am ah. going to have some time during the Christmas break. So that might happen. 
but uh i'm excited again this is a type of thing that we do right it's it's okay. like it's like we can easily just be happy enough with what we do and just make the same thing over and over again and but we're always trying to that's my nature always looking for the next best thing like could i make it could i make it better so i told speedy about it he's kind of like my partner in crime with these crazy gunsmithing ideas and he's all for it he's like oh you just have to do it just have to do it i'm like well we're gonna do it you do it <laughs> send me videos when you do it i want to see this oh i'm gonna say it's gonna be quite crazy i assume my problem is i'm gonna end up going and buying a cnc machine which is which i need like a hole in the head right <laughs> Yeah, I tell you when CNCs are fun, it's like anything else. It takes a while to learn them, but once you learn them, they're great. But then, once you're done, it's like tuning a rifle. It's like now what? That thing yeah, just sits now, there. Now, now. It just sits and does the same thing over and over and over again. But yeah, it's quite fun. But it'll be fun. I'll send you some videos. Send me videos, my friend. All right, man. This, this has been fun. a lot of fun. Thank yeah. you. Thanks for having me on again. Love what you do, my friend. And, uh, you know, thanks thank for you. I'll, uh, I'll reach out to, uh, to Don and say, Hey, you've been nominated. And, uh, a rule that I made up is that once you're nominated, you can't, you can't yeah, say man. no. I like it. <laughs> I like it. Reach, reach out to Don. By the way, you uh, were talking before, about, before you do, give me a call and I'll give you some good ample material bust his balls with. All right. Oh, I will. All right, man. Thank you. I'll see Merry you Christmas. Happy new year. You, Take care. I'm feeling me